Twitter, that is YouTube, that is the news site. There is hardly any web China anywhere. So such a vibrant internet society. One is about China being represented on internet. Second is how China has used internet because now it is number one country in, inter in the world in uh, in internet users. It has used it extensively for education, for health, for e, e governance, and all. I mean, all every aspects of life. So in this kind of scenario, uh, I would like to have your opinion about how is China's internet strategy. Recently, Google selection it was in India, and now maybe you will agree with me that people now take politicians or leaders less seriously and take these people more seriously because and he kind of criticized China about internet. And so I would like to have your view about the internet strategy of China. Shall I tackle questions? Uh, one by one, or yeah, take uh, three, one by one. Yeah. That will allow uh, my mind to be fresh. Uh, thank you, sir, for your very challenging question. I said I'll, I'll never dodge any questions. Uh, let me just uh, share with you what I have in mind. Uh, the figure you gave that 25% of the Chinese people are the world international, world international users. Uh, Probably the figure is a little bit more than in my uh, figures. Uh, uh, let me just say these three points for you for your reference. The first one, internet has become part of the China's national strategy to take full stock for Chinese for Chinese economy to join the mainstream world economy. Internet has been doing a miracle for the Chinese government, for the Chinese companies, and for the Chinese people. You wouldn't believe it, my uh, daughter is asking me to buy things here while I'm here. So he, he, uh, she was doing the, the, you know, uh, online shopping around the world, taking the advantage that it, you know, her you know, parents are working here as diplomats here. So, Internet has become part of China's government policy to encourage and support. In fact, the infrastructure expenditure by the central and the provincial governments have been increasing year by year. Government invests into internet sector by providing more MAs and BAs and PhD degrees to the college in the college students. They provide the trainings for people who are at work in various circles. They invest a lot on the infrastructure construction so that people could have more easy access to internet technology. And the second one is how Chinese government manage its internet what you call it, uh, internet you know, sector. Let me tell you, it's uh, one of the biggest headaches for the governments at all levels. You know, anything has its two sides. You know, so on the one hand, internet users are contributive, they are conducive to the government policy, but people via internet can voice out their discontents, dissatisfaction, their criticism against the government as they like. They have no way to stop it. They can block some, but not all. The internet governance has become a new challenge for the Chinese government. It is not, I, it does not mean that the Chinese government want to cut it off. Simply Chinese government has to learn how to do it. The government itself is also learning, in the learning curve, to master the rules and the benchmarks and they want to expand the market, but they don't know how to manage the market. It's kind of a scenario hawk. And thirdly, really, the internet is playing a constructive part uh, to the national governments, to the political and the economic reforms. Let me give you an example. Three months ago, Beijing, uh, the, the National Public, uh, Security, Public Security Bureau uh, announced a reg new regulation that any drivers who stop the, their cars at the, at the traffic light with their front wheels across the line would receive the fine. 
that was when this new regulation was put out, just within two weeks, millions of protests were, appeared on the internet that the government went into, took it back for reconsideration. This one constructive part, I think, which China should learn to make more use of. So internet it has its double faces. So Chinese government would have to, and in fact, the new uh, national development strategy has incorporated internet technology into a major part as a contributing factor to the future growth. But at the same time, the new legislations will be uh, implemented um, on the basis of the uh, opinions, uh, opinions including from my, uh, people like me, uh, from the academic circle and the industrial circle, and from the people from the civil societies. And thirdly, China has a lot to learn from uh, countries like uh, India, even countries like India and some other countries who are having more, you know, dy dynamic <coughs> policies and uh, uh, institutions across the country. And just a short first question, how internet is a tool for India and China friendship? Because it is very difficult for Indians if you have to locate Chinese youth or someone whom I can talk to, but it is very difficult to find on internet. Uh, this is, I think, a little bit beyond me. I am an economist. I do not know how to, how to tell you what the access I have to be friend. What I don't know, I, I, I don't want to pretend I know. But I think that my people would help you to how to get the access so that you can chat and communicate with the Chinese you know, website friends. Sir? Uh, I already greeted you at the entrance. Yes, I remember. And uh, not only prayed, but wished strongly for a closer relationship between India and China. Mm -hmm. But I would like to mention here that your lecture was a masterpiece of an erudite lecture. Thank you. As it was said. Mm -hmm. And what I like is that China and to some extent India strive for excellence in every sphere of individual and collective activity so that the whole nation rises to high levels of endeavor and achievement. And you have made a presentation with management expertise. A management expert gives a brief summary of his speech at the beginning, his objectives. Then the objectives are translated into the plan and the words. And that is meant to stir the people to respond to what he has said. And yeah, the question is, the question is that India and China together can uh, focus on a higher quality of life, more of human relations than of trade, to improve the life of both the nations. That is the basic question. Thank you for listening to me. Uh, I certainly comprehend your question. Uh, let me share with you what I would see that future bilateral relations between India and China. Let me give you a figure. Economists talk about things always on figures. Let me give you another group of figures. When we put India, India and the Chinese bar pe you know, people together, you know how much it comes to? 37% exactly of the global population. So when the two giant neighbors join hands, who else would stop? The trend. Just think of it. I have mentioned at the very beginning that you know the Himalayas could be the geographical uh, barrier, but it could be a bridge to connect our two countries together. Now, how should the more cooperative relations would benefit our two countries? These are the areas. First, immediately it will help to grow the economic skills of the two countries through trade, investment. And second is to promote the productivity of, the bo of both economies. You know, if a company is staying in the country, just within the country, my observation is they tend to get the fatigue yes, at certain periods. Only by cooperation and the collaboration and the competition based on the rules, the companies would become stronger and more competitive. 
So the improvement, the, the, the competitiveness of our two economies will be the second category, I think. The third one is bilateral trade, investment, and industrial cooperation will certainly help to improve the benefits, welfare of the people on both sides. Definitely it will do, the governments will get more taxes, companies earn more profits, you know, people related to those businesses will get more pay, definitely. And more importantly, these economic and trade relations will promote, will just help to reduce the suspicion, misunderstanding, it will help to promote the mutual understanding and friendship, you know, the worst thing to any bilateral cooperation is the misconception because of the lack of communication, a lack of exchange of business. So trade would help people to get closer from the economic perspective than tourists, cooperation in the tourist sector could do a lot more. I had a discussion yesterday when I was in, in uh, around back, around back, around back. back. So with these other areas, and strategically at the regional governance, at the global governance, both India can join hands to do a lot more, so that we would have to reform those, you know, game rules which are not in our national situation, not in our common interest. When China acts alone, or when India acts alone, the voice may be weak, but when 37% of people speak in one voice, it's going to be across Himalaya, across the Pacific, or Indian Oceans, to get everywhere, right? So, thank you. Thank you, thank you, sir. Okay. So thank you for the speech, and you can from the Reliance. Oh, oh Reliance, oh. Yeah. So uh, the question is, uh, you know, talking about trade and you know, bilateral relations, uh, there, there is a need to grow the trade between India and the neighbors and China and its neighbors. China is already doing very well, India has to. So India is trying a lot to get into, uh, let's say, Asia and plus. Uh, but uh, where sometimes we feel that China is blocking. So is it a miscommunication or is it that the policy of China would change towards this, uh, of including India into several of the trade blocks that we already in? Because China is such a strong uh, 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 political force and economic force that if China objects, India would not be allowed to get it. So that's some of the perception that the business community has. So that's something that I wanted you to do. Uh, you know, my dear friend, I won't be frank with anybody. I may have to dispute with you, disagree with you in some of your observations here. Let me share with you what I have in mind. You can disagree with me here. But we, uh, we, we, uh, we agree to disagree, but we agree to put together our interests, right? I, I would just like to say that I learned from you a lot. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. In terms of the market openness, China fares better even the United States. China is the most open market economy in the world. This is not what I, my conclusion, this is the Secretary General of the WTO last year in October. China observes the gain, you know, the commitment when it, since it was admitted as the, uh, the, the member, China observed 97% of its obligations and commitments. I think that was a record no country has ever broken. You know, China is the second largest economy. It's, a, it's such an old economy, there would be no reason for China to, 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 to block Indian entry, the, the, the entry of the Indian products. By the way, the bilateral trade was only 70 billion US dollars. That's a great number, right? But in terms of the China's total foreign, you know, foreign, the foreign trade, it's less than 2%. 37 of the total po global population with only 2% of China's trade. It's too small. China is open its door. I, in fact, I think we have, do have something to revisit by both governments. The Chinese government would have to make its policies more transparent, more uh, easier to comprehend. China has to provide 
more uh, available services so that the Indian companies would have more access to China. In this regard, my Council of General would be in the capacity to do that. So I, 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 I'm sorry I didn't bring my you know, commercial council with me, but I think you, Reliance is the company I want to get in touch with. I've already got in touch with uh, you know, uh, Ratan Tata, the, the, the former president of uh, Tata Group. I'm trying to reach out to as many as Indian companies as possible. So if you find any barriers, just let me know. I'll, I'll find out. To, just first to find out if they are real barriers or because of miscommunications. My guess is that uh, miscommunications. Not because of the, you know, you know subjective, uh, because of the, objective speaking, you didn't find the right channel, you ended up being blocked. In fact, China is uh, reaching out to India, to your country, to sign the bilateral free trade agreement. But I think we just, the Chinese side is waiting. For your prime minister to say yes, yeah. So, yes. Well, yes. Hi. Um, can you throw some light on um, the talk tomorrow between the two prime ministers? Um, we know it's um, there's a lot of trade. Uh, bilateral trade mm. will definitely be an issue. For the details, you have to check on the website of the Chinese. But let me share with you what I guess. And because I used to advise them you know, when I was in Beijing, I know what they basically, in principle, I, I can share with you for sure. The, the most pending issue for Prime Minister and the new leader, the, the, the President Xi Jinping, would be how to build up on the current strategic relations that is tilted towards the, the prosper, common prosperity and you know, coordination, how to build on their personal understanding and friendship. <laughs> Heads of states play, we, I presently rate as 50% of the violent relations. Leaders are more important than the government's leaders. So how to build on the political understanding and friendship, so that they will give the political guidance, they will make big political decisions on tough issues. And secondly, is how to resolve uh, the common concerns of both sides. Because the kind of uh, the worries and concerns or complaints would stop both sides from further reaching out to the other side. And the thirdly is to identify ways how to promote not only trade, but investment. You would agree with me here. The more trade we do, the more deficit Indian side will have. This is the, 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 you know, the economic rule, because the, the inter-industrial trade would produce mm -hmm. deficit. If one side is relatively weak in income competitiveness, but the trade, the, the investment. That is why I have a mission when I came here. So to promote the bilateral investment so that it, they will immediately have to reduce the trade imbalance to provide the jobs for the local communities. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the Chief Minister Chavan and the Industrial Minister Rane were both very supportive of these ideas and the cultural exchanges. Probably, let me just uh, you know, uh, bravely project, probably the FDA will be promoted. And, uh, the ways and means to resolve the border issues, uh, definitely. This is, has been an established part of this idea. You know, we have to get it across. We have two Himalayas standing between us. Himalaya and the border issues. Mm -hmm. I got it, Thank you. Uh, let's give one more to, 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 to the young lady here. You know, we, we have to be fair, we, we haven't seen women holds half of, half of the sky in China. That's not yeah, please. We are working on the same team. Uh, we are from the RIT Development Group. We are in the economics team. So, uh, my question uh, both are related to economics. Uh, you made a statement on inflation. You said India and China are on the same boat. Uh, the, the understanding we have, according to data in the public domain for China, uh, it increased last year, but it actually was controlled very well by monetary policy. It's coming back up now. But uh, our understanding is China's inflation was controlled very well, very different from India's inflation. And uh, I also want your uh, outlook on the property market in China. Property market? 
property property market in China, which is uh, there's a lot of discussion going on on that. So, two questions: How China manages this inflation, right? And the second second is the situation at, at the Chinese property market, right? Did I understand you correctly? Yeah. Okay. The first one is very simple. As an economist, let me share with you what I see through this uh, critical issue. The first one is to provide adequate supply of goods and services. This is the only you know, meaningful way to bring the inflation under control. And the second is to try to encourage consumption. And thirdly, is to improve the efficiency both from the perspective of the government management and also the industrial production. So these are the three areas that China has uh, been you know, doing things which have been relatively successful. Otherwise, the inflation will be run away. And secondly is the property markets. Let me just say this. The mortgage industry is growing at long, to say the least. China needs to do a lot to get this fixed. All of the, 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 the uh, market industry is, and the stock market is going abnormally too, for two reasons. Chinese uh, national and provincial authorities simply do not know yet the proper ways how to govern, monitor, and secondly, too much speculative forces are coming from overseas. They have the high expectation that women beings is going to appreciate, further appreciate. They are putting their eggs in order to, for one egg to, to come up with two baby chickens, <laughs> to earn the extra profit. You know, uh, these are the two reasons. And thirdly, China does have to move forward in the financial reform, because what's the sound basis for the financial uh, institutions, the policies, and the management, only by then China will be able to manage properly the, the, the property market. So the market industry needs to be overhauled, the financial sector has to be overhauled, and uh, China has, has to learn a lot more from neighboring countries, including India, I think. Uh, in some areas, I, I did find out some things we could, you know, uh, tap into, I barely uh, dropping notes. When I go home, I definitely will see something. You know, this is kind of not seeing, but by you know borrowing the nice experiences. <laughs> and this is another thing uh, which we can share. Yes, sir. Um, my name is uh, Pankaj Baliga. I work with uh, Tata Consultancy Services. Good to meet with you. Welcome to Mumbai. Mm -hmm. uh, Consultant, uh, my question to you is that. Uh, we, uh, if you think that uh, India and China has for better relations, uh, possibility, I don't want to talk Prosperity about Prosperity and coordination. <laughs> the no, strategic I, partnership. I, I, uh, I, though I am from the IT field, I am going to ask you something more general. Please. Uh, if uh, India and China want to formalize their better relations, what are the, do you think? sharing best practices between the two countries because our problems are similar. Uh, do you think we should have such a, a kind of an apex body that gets into sharing best practices? And if that is so, what do you think are some of these best practices we should share so that 37% of the world's population live a better life? Thank you. That's terrible. That's surely a general question. A question in principle, it would take two books to complete your, uh, you know, to, to complete the answer to your. Let me just try to to, to uh, reply in one, uh, in one minute, if I uh, can manage. Um, these are my personal roadmap for the future biological relations between India and China. First, we need to cut down our trust deficit. We, the bilateral relations not moving fast enough as, as uh, they, are, they are expected is simply because of the political, strategic trust deficit. Second is more communications and exchanges of personnel at the company levels and the government levels. The more exchange of visits 
and more exchange of information. And third is more cooperation. Cooperation not only in trade but investment in technology. In the areas of technology, India is doing much better than China, especially in the IT, and pharmaceutical, textile. I think China is a textile giant. But I discovered in terms of technology, India is doing better than China and in general. Okay? So, and the exchange of uh, you know, national governments, the good practices you know, could be shared at the bilateral talks. We have the annual uh, uh, you know, dialogues. And number five is um, FDA, institutional constructions. And number six is the regional and global governments. When we two countries join hands, we can form a single voice to form the same, same put forward a similar you know, policy proposals, agendas, which would be helping to protect our joint interests or the convergence of interests, to, to, uh, to seek the common development, development space. Because China, both India and China cannot afford just to, to regard it, they are all territories for the future space. Both India and China have to go global. This is a natural thing, but on the basis, on the basis of rules. And China has, uh, both China and India are peace-loving countries. We have to refrain from repeat the traditional way of a country become a powerful, a world power by conquering or invading. And those both India and China have the, the capability to do that, even the intention. So we have this in common. So basically on the six points roadmap for further improvement of our conditions. Thank you.
the BRIC members would have to identify more institutions which help, would help in turn to promote the mutual cooperation. I thank God. Uh, a project proposal is mentioned in general, but once it comes down to economic details, then it blocks, then it gets boxed down. And third is the, the experts' institutions where uh, the political decisions would be made and the institutions would be there. We need to set up the experts' institutions to draft the policy proposals to make sure that they are implemented and the evaluations will be done. Yeah. We have a last three questions. Yeah, okay, I agree. <laughs> I like in your hands, so I, I can go on for four hours, no problem. More fun, I deserve myself. Okay. <laughs>
it is the sincere hope of China that both countries would develop the normal state relation because uh, India and Pakistan were brothers, right? I was uh, uh, trying to take another trip to Pakistan to visit one of the birthplaces where the, the Buddha was born. So uh, it is uh, my understanding. Thank you, note. It's a what? <laughs> now you believe my 
my story. I love any other story. China has secured put aside almost getting close to two trillion US dollars. Forty percent. See how much? Exactly the total bill of the US fought the war in Iraq. Eight hundred million. Exactly. You see, the US is clever. It doesn't have to, to write off the debt, it's simply printing more money. <laughs> in, India would have a lot to lose money. You and I should have US dollars, we lose money. All of you, if you have the US dollar, you are losing money. Second question. And the first one is uh, with regard to the urbanization. It is true. With 1% of uh, people coming to the city, theoretically, it produced. 14 million people who have the capability to consume, but not all of them will have the capacity immediately. But in the long term, when they settle down in a city, when, they, when the towns and cities get more established, they will become the middle class, so to speak. They are, they are just give you, giving you the kind of figurative uh, you know, uh, figures. So uh, just and that's along the line, not exactly what 1% uh, would mean. 40 million people who are the capable consumers, not necessarily that way. Last question. What do you think we need to do? No, we'll, we'll talk about it afterwards, I promise. My question is question. Your name is? I used to have a solo show on I mean, in the East Year. I don't belong to any organization. I got the news and can't be here. Most but my question is a very uncomfortable question. Yeah, please. You talk about trust deficit. Trust deficit. Trust deficit. Tomorrow, our Prime Minister and your President is going to meet. I wish they don't come too close. Because we have seen when Nehru went too close to China, to China life, what happened in 62. But a lot of water is flowed through the Brahmaputra. And still now we are building dams on that. On one way you talk about defensive, but on the other hand you are doing exactly opposite. You are arming Pakistan, you have laid your hand in Burma, that is Myanmar, <coughs> you have laid your hand in Sri Lanka, you want to encircle us. You can build port in Sri Lanka, but when our ONGC dig wells in Vietnam, you become jittery. But how this can happen? If there has to be reciprocation, there has to be distrust deficit has to reduce. Otherwise, how it can go for? That is my question. Unfortunately, this is uh, the last question. But I'll make it uh, not, you know, unhappy as possible, okay? I'll try to tackle it from the other way around. <clears throat> Political distrust strategic trust would not come into being overnight. In that sense, it will take a little bit longer, usually, to dispel, to reduce the distrust. Trust deficit can work positively if we take the right approach to that. I remember a, a saying in China when I was a, a, at primary school, you never sleep on the hatred of yesterday. We ne you should never sleep on the hatred of yesterday. We should adopt, both sides should adopt the forward-looking mindset. Should, both sides should implement the forward looking policy measures. In this regard, take the border issue for example. We have conducted 14 rounds of bilateral discussions and the 15th round is to take place soon, very soon. I agree with you. Leaders should not get too close. It's a taboo. Only you know, like the, 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 the British leaders and the US leaders can say we are brothers. I think no other countries can afford to have the brothers, you know, brothership, uh, uh, we call it brother-like relations. 
my thought really is China, India should work on the convergence of interests. That is to say, both India and China should work on the agreed principles to work towards the agreed interests. We should agree to disagree, but we also should agree to work together so that we can build up more trust. We can reduce the distrust. With regard to the Chinese relations with uh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Burma, China has its net bilateral economic and security, including the defense interests with all those countries. Nobody should deny that. I'm not denying that. The simple question is, all the major countries has, has its global strategic layout. India has its global layout. If I have to mention it, you know, India has its relations with Japan, with you know, South Korea, with the ASEAN countries. <coughs> you name it. It's the global, you know, major countries have global strategic layout. It's a must. But we do have to make sure these global layout should not hinder the bilateral relations with all the relevant countries in the region. And that is why China has regarded India as a strategic partner towards common prosperity and coordination. Within the framework of BRICS, Chinese and the Indian leaders have met, have been meeting constantly 14 times in a year. It's a record. They, their regular meetings would help to, for both sides to avoid the drastic or antagonistic, antagonistic feelings or reactions from the mass media and from the people in general. It is up for the leaders of both countries to steer the bilateral relations in the middle course, which would serve the mutual interest, which would help to reduce the, 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 the trust deficit. I wonder if you if I had a second question. Thank you. <coughs> no. My last question. Yeah. <laughs> recent speech, he said that in order to realize this dream, and in fact, in order to reach two major landmarks that you also mentioned in your, uh, mm. your earlier presentation, yeah. that's 2021, yeah. that's the, the founding of the Council, CPC, CPC, and 2049, the founding of the People's Republic. Yeah. See, mm -hmm. yes. He said that uh, we can reach these two hundreds, these are two hundreds, only if we learn from the sages of the past. You know, this is a speech that he delivered. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned and Gandhi would be ready for China, right? And I read your paper too. Yeah. No, the, 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 the speech was at the party school. Yeah, yeah sure. So this. Uh, you know, it came as quite, uh, you know, quite significant that he says that the Communist Party officials should learn from the sages of the past. Mm -hmm. He did not, to the best of my knowledge, emphasize that they should learn from Marx, Lenin, or Mao. <coughs> so could you throw some light on how the Communist Party, and especially its new leadership, is thinking of its future as being in alignment with its past. You said that you know, 
Chinese socialism, socialism with Chinese characteristics. What are these Chinese characteristics? Chinese characteristics. That's a, 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 a million pound <laughs> a worth of uh, you know, question. But anyway, uh, let me, uh, two questions, in fact. Uh, let me just try to share with you from a, an academic perspective. For, you know, because of my capacity back in China, I had many chances to be close uh, so that I could hear him speak and I could read his reports very, uh, you know, uh, easily. He said when he was at the party school where I had the opportunity once to attend, uh, he mentioned that all the senior public servants and politicians would have to learn and take stock from the vision of the sages. And why he didn't mention Mao, Karl Marx, Lenin, Stalin, and Mao, and then the reasons is very simple. For those senior public servants and politicians, they were born, they were educated when they were junior public servants and politicians. Uh, you know, people will be kind of, uh, you know, repeating down, you know, for the same thing when you mention again and again. Because what they, what President Xi Jinping mentioned, in particular about the sages from history, is the philosophies that would be conducive to address the contemporary issues like social harmony, social justice. Governors from the top. We mentioned the corruption. Corruption is the government, uh, the governor's failure from the top. It is very appropriate time for the new leader to advise all his junior colleagues to watch what they do, what they say, what they live and associate. These are the four areas. He wanted his, all his junior colleagues to watch out and think twice before they should move beyond these four areas. And the second point that I'm making is for a long time, because of the Cultural Revolution and the economic reforms and opening up, the revisit to the treasure house of the historian figures, the great philosophers and great thinkers and writers <coughs> have for some extent neglected. I think it's a good time when China is at the crossroad for the leader at the top to remind the hope that the top leaders and the politicians and throw them to the people and the governments at all levels and to the people across the country that it's time to seek references from the good traditions, heritages and traditions which will help to consolidate what the country needs at the moment. I think I read your paper the other day, you recommended that Gandhi should be a good candidate. In fact, China needs to learn from, uh, to seek references from many other visions of the sages from overseas. Gandhi and Nero will be the two, I can see. Uh, and the, the Buddha, for example, was, was also I just don't believe in. Why not? It's the new sign for the new leadership to be liberalized, to be open to any creative thinking, be it from the past, from the present, or from the future. And the second part is, uh, um, is uh, the Chinese, uh, you said, the Chinese characteristics. For China, the socialism with Chinese characteristics is a difficult, which will take two to three books to explain to the international community. Really, it's a complicated situation. Uh, let me just share with you uh, in, in one or two minutes. Socialism with Chinese char uh, characteristics can simply be divided into two parts. At the political front, uh, China is going to build it to realize its ultimate goal, that was to form 
a multi-party cooperation political system under the leadership of the Communist Party. And the second is the system of political consultation among all the political forces and all sectors of society, also within the Chinese uh, leadership, uh, the leadership of the, the, the Communist Party. So this is the ultimate goal, the political front. And at economic front is to build <laughs> market economy again in line with the Chinese national situation. The situation in China will be changing. So that kind of market economy would have to be modified in order to adapt to the changing situation there. As far as I can know, in terms of market economy principles, China is doing much better even than some of the developed countries. This is what uh, President Obama admitted, and uh, the, the, the uh, President William had to argue with President Obama. My economy system is more open than yours. He wouldn't agree. The, 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 the figures would support that. Uh, so, and thirdly, uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics is uh, at foreign policy levels. China would have to stick to the pathway of peaceful development. China will not and should not, must not, to repeat the roadmap of traditional power by conquering or invading others. This has been written into the constitution of China. This has become the, an important part of the Chinese national development strategy. So these are definitely, in terms of national defense, I think, if I can just say, the uh, worries that China may use its uh, military capability to push for its unilateral interests. Uh, the simple fact is no country can push for its unilateral economic and political means through the military you know, means. Take the U.S. for example. It could launch a war in Iraq. Can it achieve what he wanted? And you know the the you know, the, the retired the, the Secretary of State, so Hillary Clinton, that why we have so many Iraqis who are failing us, they're hating us rather than you know supporting us, and why the U.S. has to pull up before it's realized its goals in Afghanistan. So this. Is, it would be a fully, too much fully for China to repeat uh, President Obama or uh, you know, President Bush Jr. China would have no reason. I wonder if I have tackled your question. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.